Hello, everybody. We're going to get started with our Bacchus Uncorked program. Um, my name is Shelby Brown, and I'm a senior education specialist here, and all of us at the Villa are really excited to have a Bacchus Uncorked on site again, and to welcome you all here for a beautiful evening. This is a series that explores the intersection of the ancient world through discussions of wine cultivation and drinking practices, which we all love. And our special exhibitions often inspire us. And this evening's program is inspired by Persia, ancient Iran, and the classical world. Please welcome Sarah Cole. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Cole, and I'm delighted to introduce you to this evening's Bacchus Uncorked program. As Shelby mentioned, I'm an assistant curator of antiquities here at the Villa, and I'm one of the curators of our current special exhibition, Persia, Ancient Iran, and the Classical World, to which tonight's program is related. And I hope you've all had the chance to visit the exhibition, but if not, it is on view on the second floor of the Villa until August 8th, so we do hope that you will come back and see it. So I'll say a few words about the exhibition. Um, this is the second exhibition in a series that we are doing here at the Getty called The Classical World in Context. Because here at the Villa, our permanent collection is primarily made up of antiquities from Greece, Rome, and Etruria. But of course, the ancient Mediterranean and Near East was populated by many other great cultures and civilizations who exchanged influences with Greece and Rome. And those cross-cultural relationships are what this series aims to explore. By organizing major international loan exhibitions, we can expand the narrative that we tell about the ancient world here at the villa and demonstrate how diverse and interconnected the ancient Mediterranean was. This exhibition covers a period of about 1,200 years of history, beginning with the establishment of the Persian Empire in the Achaemenid period, starting around 550 BC. So that is the subject of the first gallery of the exhibition, which you see here. And then we go into the second phase of the empire under the Parthian rulers who rose to power in Iran in the third century BC in the wake of Alexander the Great's conquests. And that's the focus of our second gallery. Our third and final gallery covers the Sasanian dynasty, who ruled uh, following the Parthians up until the Arab conquest of AD 651. And this is the first exhibition to explore the relationship between Persia, Greece, and Rome over the full chronological span of the ancient Persian Empire. And it brings together significant works of art that are on loan from over 30 different lending institutions. And if you visited the exhibition, or when you do, you will notice that a major theme running through all of the galleries is the prevalence of exquisitely crafted gold and silver drinking vessels that were used at royal and aristocratic banquets in ancient Persia. Banqueting was a central practice of the Persian court, and the objects that were used at these events, especially these exquisite vessels used to consume wine, were infused with multiple levels of meaning. And it is those practices and their associated tableware that our speaker today will be discussing. So our first speaker is John Lee, professor of history at UC Santa Barbara. Professor Lee grew up in Asia and Hawaii and studied history at the University of Washington in Seattle and then received his PhD in history from Cornell University. His publications include A Greek Army on the March, Soldiers and Survival in Xenophon's Anabasis, published in 2008, a series of recorded lectures for the Great Courses on the Persian Empire in 2012, and the volume The First Black Archaeologist, A Life of John Wesley Gilbert, published this year, 2022. He studies the history of ancient West Asia, especially war, society, and culture in the Greek and Achaemenid world from about 650 to 330 BC. And today he will be presenting on drinking and eating with Greeks and Persians. And now please welcome Professor Lee. Good evening, everyone. It's a real delight 
uh, to be here. Thank you, Sarah, for that very kind introduction, and thank you, Shelby, for getting, uh, getting us started off this evening. And thank you all for, for being here. You know, when I arrived at UC Santa Barbara back in 2000, the, this Getty Villa was still in the process of renovation. So, but as soon as it opened, I became a regular visitor, both to see the exhibitions myself, to bring students and bring community groups. And there have been so many exhibitions here that have been highlights of my experiences as a scholar, especially the 2013 Cyrus Cylinder Exhibition, which brought that very famous artifact here uh, to the Getty Villa. Um, my wife, who was with me uh, here last night, and I, that was the, the last exhibition that we came to uh, as a couple before we had three children. And unfortunately, she had to go back home, but uh, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, opportunity to speak at the Getty is also our first, has been our first time away from those three kids. Uh, so those of you who are parents will know. <laughs> uh, so my topic today is drinking and eating with Greeks and Persians, and there's going to be a little bit of a, of a setup, and so you may wonder, where are we going before we get to the drinking part? So bear with me uh, about, that, about that portion. So let's start, though, with this coin, um, which if you've been to the uh, galleries, perhaps you looked at, perhaps you uh, overlooked as you passed on to much more grand and much larger artifacts. You know, in the popular mind, when we think about Greeks and Persians uh, in the Achaemenid period, that is the, the earliest of the three Persian dynasties that are represented in the galleries, uh, despite all the scholarly work that's been done, in the popular mind there's still a perception of either or, Greece versus Persia, East versus West, a clash of civilizations. But to look at a coin like this, presents a much more entangled, a much more complex picture of the interaction of Greeks and Persians. This coin was minted in what is today southwestern Turkey, sometime in the early 300s BC. It was minted by a satrap, or a governor, of the Persian Empire. You can see what may be his portrait on one side of the coin. Turn the coin over, and even if you could not read at all, you would recognize the royal archer with his spear and his bow, a symbol of imperial Persian power. So this is a coin of the Persian Empire. But it's also a coin that is struck to a Greek standard and that bears a Greek inscription, Basileos, of the king. So here on this one coin, we see that entanglement between Greeks and Persians. Now, who would use such a coin, you might ask? And it's kind of the equivalent of maybe a $100 bill. It's not the sort of thing you would buy something small with. Uh, but most likely, this coin and others like it were minted in order to pay Greek mercenaries, either sailors who sailed in the navies of the great king or infantrymen. And I'll show you a picture uh, of the infantry in a moment. And if you look uh, next to the standing royal figure and you sort of turn your head to the side, you'll see a representation of a galley, an oar galley of the type that might be rowed by Greek mercenary rowers. Here, on this famous relief from the Nereid Monument from Xanthos in Lycia, again, modern southwestern Turkey, you can see infantrymen, uh, so-called hoplites at the left of the image with their characteristic round shields, their bronze helmets. Sometimes they also wore bronze body armor. They carried long spears and uh, swords. So coins like the one I just showed you would have been used to pay both mercenaries on land and at sea. And the Persian governors of the West in Anatolia and elsewhere along the western frontiers of the empire and the Persian king himself liked to use Greek mercenaries. By around 400 BC there were tens of thousands of these, you might call them immigrant laborers, Greek soldiers working in the Persian empire. In this case, they, uh, they, this may represent Greek mercenary bodyguards of the Lycian dynast or ruler, Erbina, who's portrayed on the Nereid monument. You can see him enthroned uh, there. You may have perhaps heard of the most famous of all Greek mercenaries, Xenophon, an Athenian. Uh, Xenophon was born in 427 BC. He lived until about 350 BC, thereby living through one of the most tumultuous periods uh, in the history of classical Greece. Uh, and an important period in the history of the Achaemenid Empire. Um, he's almost the same age 
as Plato. Uh, they were near contemporaries. You can imagine little boy Plato and little boy uh, Xenophon running around together. And if you have ever flown into the Athens International Airport and looked out the window of your aircraft, um, you're flying over Xenophon's hometown because his local district or village uh, is basically just north of the modern Athens International Airport. As a youth, Xenophon hung out with Socrates and ancient writers after him, in fact, knew Xenophon more as a philosopher than as we do. We know him as a, more of a historian today. He was also a technical expert. For example, uh, he wrote a book on horsemanship that is still consulted and appreciated today uh, by modern equestrians. Uh, and he was a mercenary general. And it was as part of his service as a mercenary officer that Xenophon was able to experience the Persian Empire firsthand. So he lived amongst Persians. He worked, you might say, with Persians. Uh, he spoke with Persians. He observed the empire in many different regions. And he therefore provides us a unique and priceless insight into the world of the Persian Empire. Now, from a Greek person's viewpoint, of course, but nonetheless, a perspective that was based on a lot of experience, a lot of firsthand uh, experience. And he recorded those observations in many of his works. Xenophon wrote about 15 different works. Uh, there are only two, really, that I'll have time to mention to you this evening. One you may have heard of, the Syropideia, or the Education of Cyrus. This is a fictionalized biography of the founder of the Persian Empire, Cyrus of Anshan, or Cyrus the Great, the ruler who issued the edict that's carved on the Cyrus cylinder, who, as you can see from the screen, uh, lived and died a century before Xenophon was born. But in another work, his Anabasis, or March Up Country of Cyrus, Xenophon recounts his experiences uh, as a mercenary with the Greek troops that were recruited by another Persian prince, a young man named Cyrus the Younger, just a few years younger than Xenophon himself. Uh, Cyrus the Younger was the younger brother of King Artaxerxes the second. So uh, Xenophon was able to talk directly, speak directly with a member of the Persian royal family. Now you might ask, how does a Greek from Athens get to meet a Persian prince? Well, he didn't set out uh, I, or expect that he would have the experience. Uh, basically, Xenophon got a letter from a Greek friend who said, you know, Cyrus is the greatest man that you can imagine. He is virtuous, he is generous, he is kind. Why don't you come and join us? Because he's planning this expedition to punish some bandits in his realm, which is near the region of Sardis in what's today Western Turkey. So Xenophon went along, and not knowing that Cyrus had another plan. Cyrus's plan was to march into the heart of the Persian Empire, defeat his older brother Artaxerxes, talk about sibling rivalry, right? Uh, and take the throne of Persia for himself. If he did it quickly enough, he could march to Babylon before Big Brother could get his army together. He could maybe even peel away some support from amongst the nobles of the empire. So along with Cyrus went Xenophon, uh, beginning early in 401 BC. It took them about six months to make their way through Anatolia and then down the Tigris Valley. Um, but Cyrus's plan didn't work. Uh, his brother managed to get an army together, and it, in the fall of 401, the two brothers and their forces clashed at a village north of Babylon, a place called Kunaxa, and Cyrus was killed. So here's Xenophon in the middle of the Persian Empire, uh, having experienced, by the way, the food and drink of that empire as he marched uh, up, the, up from the coast with Cyrus, but along with the 10,000 Greek mercenaries who had come along with Cyrus, now trapped in the middle of the empire. Now, Xenophon's obituary of Cyrus the Younger um, is notable for its extremely positive portrayal of this Persian prince. I mean, once again, remember, this is a Greek talking about a prince who many back in Athens would consider just a barbarian. But Xenophon, in contrast, describes Cyrus in glowing terms. The most kingly man there has been among the Persians since Cyrus the Elder, and the one who most deserved to rule, as is agreed, among all those who had personal experience of him. And notice how Xenophon stresses the personal experience part, because he had known Cyrus uh, the Younger himself. 
And in fact, according to the story that Xenophon tells, we have other versions, Cyrus actually got within striking distance of his brother. He managed to wound his brother, but in the melee that followed, the prince was cut down. So imagine if that blow had gotten just a little bit deeper and Cyrus had managed to survive. The whole story of uh, Persian history might have been changed dramatically. But it wasn't to be, and young Prince Cyrus died. The obituary of Cyrus that Xenophon provides is one of a great leader, personally courageous, insightful in leadership, able to inspire loyalty among all who followed him, generous to his friends, but also, and now we come uh, directly to our topic of drinking and eating, also someone who knew his wine. Xenophon portrays Prince Cyrus as a wine connoisseur, saying he also excelled in his care for his friends and his eagerness to bestow favors, for Cyrus would often send them half-full jars of wine whenever he obtained a wine that was especially pleasant, saying he had not come across a better wine than this for a long time, and adding, right, we think actually this might actually be an actual quotation from a message that Cyrus sent. So Cyrus has sent this to you and asked you to drink it today with your closest friends. So the ideal king shows good leadership, is generous, inspires loyalty, knows his wine, and knows when to share it, right? He has the self-control not to drink the entire, in, the entire jar because it's so good, but he shares it and he says to his friends, drink the wine today before it goes bad. Don't hold on to it just because I gave it to you as a present. So a central part of Xenophon's portrayal of the ideal Persian king uh, is of someone who knows his wine and knows the best way uh, to share it. Now you might ask, well, how was it that Cyrus and the nobles of Persia enjoyed that wine? Here again, we can turn to Xenophon for a unique textual insight. Because he lived in the Persian Empire, because he observed Persian nobles, uh, he provides the only known description of a characteristic Persian elite drinking practice. This passage comes from his Syropideia. You remember I mentioned uh, that before. The cupbearers of the kings, capital K meaning the kings of Persia, do their task elegantly and they pour their wine neatly and then present the cup, conveying it with their three fingers and offering it in such a way that the one who's about to drink can most easily take hold of it. And we can actually see visual reflections of Xenophon's passage in a number of different artistic works, perhaps most vividly and most famously in this amazing tomb fresco from southwestern Anatolia, discovered in 1970 and tragically uh, uh, looted and destroyed in 2011. If you look uh, at one side, you'll see some attendants with an attendant holding a wine pouring vessel carefully and then if we zoom in to the reclining figure who is dressed as a Persian so this is if not an actual Persian noble it is uh, someone who is a local official who has adopted Persian methods of acting drinking and dining holding his drinking cup with this three-fingered style and we find this pose this drinking pose used with a variety of different uh, drinking cups uh, used in various different regions of the Persian Empire and it's a way of saying I belong to the empire I'm part of the empire because just as the kings drink with sophistication so too do I drink uh, in this sophisticated uh, and and polished uh, manner there is another drinking vessel that Xenophon does not give us a description of. In fact, there's quite a lot of discussion about how exactly these vessels might have been used. And if you've been in the galleries, you have seen a number of examples of the uh, different silver drinking cups, and you've seen one very famous example of a riton or drinking horn. So one riton, many rita. Uh, they come in various uh, types, but typically have a horn-shaped top and then either a, an animal or a mythical creature uh, as the forepart with spouts often coming out, as in this example, between the four limbs of the creature. Uh, and scholars have debated how was this used, but it seems that the best answer might be there was no one single way. The position of the spout might have made it possible for someone to open and close that, 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 that opening for use in a religious ritual, for example, making a libation. 
Um, another panel from the Nereid monument, which I showed you earlier, shows a reclining figure, probably the dynast Urbina himself, with a riton in one hand and with a drinking cup in the other hand. So another possibility is that this is a serving vessel meant to help aerate the wine uh, rather than to be drunken directly uh, from that rather small uh, that rather small opening. And a third possibility scholars have suggested is that there's some sort of play function involved, uh, that by skillfully balancing this vessel and allowing it to direct a stream to, to a cup, uh, there's some sort of game that's involved uh, in having a riton around. Whichever one of those ways uh, this particular riton was used, it clearly reflects something of royal or noble Persian drinking practices. The levels at the very, very top of the Persian Empire. Xenophon probably saw some of these horns, but he doesn't describe anybody drinking from them. He does describe Thracians drinking from horned vessels that didn't have a spout at the bottom, but drinking from the top, as if from a big uh, goblet. But I don't think anybody was doing that with this very beautiful object. So, we left Cyrus dead on the battlefield at Kunaxa, and we left Xenophon and the 10,000 Greek mercenaries wondering how they were going to get home. Now, at first, they tried to negotiate their way out, and they seemed to have some success. But older brother Artaxerxes was, well, he was no fool. He was a smart king. He would go on to be the longest ruling of all the Persian kings. Uh, and he and his officials figured out a way to lure the Greeks north to get their commanders to come to a conference, and then they arrested and executed them. And they hoped that this would put an end to this army of mercenaries. But instead, Xenophon was elected as one of the army's new leaders, and the Greeks embarked on a march out of the empire, up the Tigris River Valley, uh, through the old agricultural heartlands of Babylonia and Assyria, then into the mountains of Carduchia, which is m basically modern uh, southern and southeastern Turkey, across the Anatolian plain, and finally to the Black Sea, where they reached the Greek town uh, of Trapezus, today modern Trabzon in Turkey, early in 400 BC, and then finally west along the Black Sea coast until they finally returned uh, early in 399 BC to uh, the, Aegean, uh, the Aegean shore. And in the process, Xenophon's account of this retreat uh, provides us all sorts of fascinating information about the lands and the peoples that he encountered along the way. And for our purposes this evening, he provides us unique insight into the drinking practices, into the kinds of beverages that were drunk, into some of the foods that went along with drink uh, along the way. Some of the places he describes are described by no other classical author, by no other textual source. So he provides a really, really vivid and important accompaniment to some of those vessels you might see uh, in the galleries. Let's start with the first stages of the retreat out of Mesopotamia, where Xenophon describes the vast uh, date gardens that he saw. There was wine, he says, from date palms, probably produced from the sap of the palms, and vinegar boiled from the same source. As for the dates themselves, the kind you see in Greece were left for the servants, but those reserved for the masters were specially selected and amazing in size and quality, gleaming just like amber. They would dry some of them and store them away for nibbles to go with their, their wine. Uh, these were pleasant with a drink, but gave people a headache. And here the soldiers also had heart of palm for the first time. So notice his emphasis on these new foods and new drinks that Greeks had never encountered. Now, what Xenophon did not know, and what we know today, thanks to study of thousands of cuneiform documents, is that the date gardens he saw were part of a vast, intensive agricultural system. You might call it agribusiness, which had been going on in Babylonia before the Persians arrived, and which the Persians had only expanded and intensified, doing things such as building irrigation canals, creating systems of hired labor, uh, uh, hiring out farm equipment, uh, all in order to produce agricultural surplus and profit for the top levels of the Persian Empire. There's no doubt that the masters that Xenophon refers to here must have been uh, the people at the top of the Persian administration. As they went further up the Tigris, however, this agricultural system dropped away, and so too did Persian power. As they entered 
the hills and mountains of Anatolia. This was a region the Persians were sometimes afraid to uh, travel into. For example, the region of the Cardukians uh, was said to be a place where an entire Persian army had disappeared. And now Xenophon and his troops are going to march uh, their way through uh, through this region, not exactly knowing where they were going. Their thought was that by following the Tigris, they would come back the way they had came, but they didn't know the Tigris and Euphrates diverged. And it was a hard march, a week of almost constant fighting through Cardukia. But Xenophon took the time to record whenever the army encountered wine. And he gives us one very fascinating description. They took quarters, he says, in many fine houses that had abundant food supplies, and indeed, lots of wine stored in plaster-lined cisterns. This is important literary evidence for a practice storing in the fermentation of wine underground uh, in, in clay containers. And here is Xenophon telling us about that 2,400 years ago. Xenophon also takes time to sh record his encounters with Persian officials. For example, a little bit after escaping from Cardukia, uh, the Greeks managed to capture the tent of a Persian noble, a man named Tirabazus. And Xenophon says, in this tent, there were couches with silver feet for drinking while reclined, drinking cups, and people calling themselves his bread makers and wine pourers. And that tells us that even beyond the central areas of the empire, Persian officials made a point of drinking and eating in the imperial style. That was a way to convey their Persianness, to show their identification with the central power of the empire. And if you go into the galleries, you will see this uh, drinking vessel. It's actually inscribed in the uh, Aramaic script, and it renders an old Persian named Tirafarna, which in Greek might have been Tirafarnes or Tirafarnes. Uh, and perhaps this is something like what the cups of Tirabazos may have been like. A different shape than the Fiale uh, cup that we saw on the Lycian monument, but still, um, you could grasp that with that delicate three-fingered grip. Now, there wasn't wine everywhere, and there weren't fine silver cups everywhere. As the army went further north, uh, as these 10,000 Greeks progressed along the way, fall turned into winter, and it got cold, and it got windy, and then it rained, and then it began to snow. And you remember that these men had come from western Turkey in the summertime. They did not have winter clothes or winter boots. It was um, a journey for which they were not equipped. And Xenophon gives us many stories of suffering under the weather, but perhaps his most detailed one comes in eastern Anatolia, where he describes the army marching over a plain and through deep snow for three days. 13 parasangs. A parasang is a Persian measure of distance, maybe three miles, roughly about three miles or an hour's walk. The third day, he says, was difficult, and a gale from the north blew straight at them, absolutely blasting everything and freezing the people uh, stiff. And he goes on to describe the, the, the damage that this uh, wind and cold inflicted on the soldiers. But what is really re remarkable is that later on in his narrative, when he looks back to this most difficult march, and he talks about the, the, you know, the, how difficult it was. Yes, he mentions the cold. Yes, he mentions the snow. He mentions the lack of food. But look what he says was the worst possible thing, right? That's the place where the food had run out, and it was not even possible to get a sniff of wine. So when you're talking about you're down in the depths, that's the worst place you are. Can't even get a sniff of, of wine. And it just highlights for us the importance of wine, both in Greek culture and as we've been talking about earlier, in Persian culture. Um, I'd also I'd point out here that uh, these photographs are by a friend of mine, Shane Brennan, who just retired from American University of Dubai. And Shane has done what uh, was my dream before I had three kids, and that is to walk the route of the Anabasis. Um, so he was actually, uh, more than a decade ago, able to walk as much of the Anabasis route as he could. Uh, and these photographs are all, are, are all courtesy of, of Shane. When the army finally got out of that terrible blizzard where people were losing their eyesight and losing their fingers and toes, they were able to find refuge in a set of underground villages uh, in a territory that he calls Armenia. Uh, and such villages underground are known in various parts of what is, uh, what is today modern, modern Turkey. Um, the ones he described had stairways for people to come down, and they also had passageways for livestock and, and animals to join 
uh, join the human inhabitants down below as protection from that terrible winter. And you might not be surprised that after the trials of marching through the snow, Xenophon's description of the, the food and the drink that he encountered in these remote villages far from the center of Persian power is extravagant. He talks about all the different kinds of meats, all the different kinds of breads, all the accompaniments. He describes the soldiers reclining to banquet and having the locals uh, act as, as banqueting attendants. And of course, he describes the drinks that the soldiers encountered. First, there was a kind of beer. He calls it barley wine in large bowls. In the bowls, he says, the grains of barley floated level with the brim and unjointed straws were left in them. Whenever anyone went to drink, he had to bend over, take these straws, and suck the liquid up into his mouth. It was very strong if you didn't add water, and very sweet was the draft who had learned the secret of drinking of it. So that we know that the villagers here had a large store of what would appear to be uh, beer. But fascinatingly, Xenophon also recounts that when the village headman had taken uh, Xenophon aside from the banqueting soldiers, he offered to show Xenophon where there was some wine hidden underground. Again, going forward to what Diego would tell you about, about the storage of wine uh, underground, and it's almost as if there are two sets of beverages in this scene. The beer for the common soldiers, and if you think about the head man, right, what does he want to do? He wants to make friends with the boss, and Xenophon appears to be the boss, so he says, hey, I've got this good wine, and I'll save it just for you. Don't, you know, don't tell the common, the common uh, folks, and think of further about that headman's perspective. He just wants to get these people out of his village, right? So make friends, be nice, be generous, and hopefully they will leave. Uh, accompanying these stories from Xenophon, we can look at a relief of an Armenian tribute bearer. Armenians are listed as one of the member peoples of the empire uh, in the royal inscriptions of the Achaemenid kings. Uh, and here is a figure from the Ar Armenian section uh, showing a tribute bearer with a very distinctive uh, vessel, perhaps holding uh, fine wine uh, offered as, as tribute. Eventually, the army got across Anatolia uh, out of the snow. And once again, here is one of, uh, one of Shane's amazing pictures. Uh, Xenophon tells the story of the army unexpectedly coming across a side of the sea, and the soldiers running up to the hilltop and yelling, the sea! the sea, a passage that's become very, very famous in Greek literature. Shane thinks it was actually from this spur of the mountain that the troops saw, uh, saw the Black Sea, which you can see there in the far distance. And if you were to follow the Black Sea coastline to the right or the east in this photograph, you would come to the shores of modern Georgia. But as the army catches sight of the sea and descends, Xenophon has one last story about unique food and drink that the soldiers encountered. And it's neither beer nor wine, but another kind of intoxicating substance. There were many swarms of bees thereabouts, he tells us. And all the soldiers who ate the honeycombs began to behave crazily and suffered from vomiting and diarrhea, and they could not stand up straight. Those who had eaten just a little seemed like people who were extremely drunk, but those who had eaten a lot appeared to be mad or even dying. I can't help thinking that some of those soldiers took just a little because they had no wine, so well, this is the closest thing I've got to wine, so I will go for the honeycomb. Uh, this kind of honey we know today is produced by bees that have uh, fed on rhododendrons, and rhododendrons uh, contain a neurotoxin that gets into the honey, and it can cause heart palpitations and, and other neurological, uh, neurological symptoms. So the mad honey uh, of, of, of Turkey is still known uh, today, and here is Xenophon describing one last encounter with an exotic foodstuff. Now, we're nearly to the end of our journey through the drinking, uh, through the drink and the food that Xenophon tells us about in his march. When we are back on the Black Sea coast, along the shore where Xenophon and his mercenaries traveled, partly by sea and partly, uh, partly on foot, in some ways we're back in more familiar Greek territory. Towns such as Trapezus, Sinope, and others, these were founded by Greek colonists. They had come from, from the Aegean into the Black Sea and founded colonies, and so they contained aspects of Greek culture, Greek language, and so on. They were familiar to Xenophon and his men, in a way, but there were also local tribes who practiced very, very different customs, and there were large 
states or, or groups uh, of local Anatolian peoples who were very powerful as well, such as the Paphlagonians. So it was a mixture. And this region was sort of both in and out of the Persian Empire. Sometimes these cities controlled themselves. Sometimes they were subject to Persian powers. So there was political and cultural uh, mixing together. And it was a very fertile region, as Xenophon tells us over and over again. At Sinope, for example, the city of Sinope, Xenophon records uh, the Sinopians are colonists from Miletus, a Greek city on the Aegean. And as tokens of their friendship, they sent the Greeks 4,500 bushels of barley and 1,500 bushels of wine. That's enough to have a pretty good party, right? At least for a couple of days for an army of, of uh, 10,000 or fewer people. And at other places, Xenophon was so taken by the landscape and its fertility that he considered trying to get the soldiers to found a city there, to settle down instead of going back to Greece, to create their, a new foundation along the Black Sea coast. Uh, the description he gives of Calpe Harbor is very attractive. The earth yields barley, wheat, all kinds of pulses, foxtail millet, sesame, figs enough, many vines producing agreeable wine. So here's Cyrus, uh, the, the model of Cyrus as a, a connoisseur of wine is now showing up uh, in Xenophon as a leader who can judge his wine and everything else except one thing that Greeks really want, which is olive trees. And if you've been to the galleries or if you haven't, I hope you go take a look at this particular vessel. It nicely resonates with Xenophon's description of the Black Sea coast as between Greek and Persian, as entangled, because this drinking cup, this fiale, is made in a Persian style, it's a Persian shape, but many of the motifs are either unknown elsewhere or they're executed in a Greek style. So it shows an entanglement of Greek and Persian culture. Even in a Greek city such as Sinope, there was someone who wanted to drink in a Persian style using a cup such as this one. Now we've come almost full circle and now we return to the Aegean shore. And Maybe you've been wondering, well, you've just described a very man's world, right? It's men banqueting, soldiers doing this, soldiers doing that, kings doing that. Uh, but one other thing that Xenophon is important for, is extraordinary for, is the attention that he gives to women as a Greek author. If any of you know the famous funeral oration of Pericles, as reported by the Greek historian Thucydides, Pericles says basically women, the best woman is the one who's least talked about uh, for good or ill, so go home, have more children, be quiet. In contrast, Xenophon often describes women, especially women officials in the Persian Empire, and he portrays them in a number of cases very positively. And here is a striking example, which comes not from his Anabasis, but from his Greek history, the Hellenica, which sort of carries on parts of the narrative of the Anabasis. Uh, and he may have, in fact, met this woman, Mania of Dardanus, uh, in person in the last stages of the, re of the return of the mercenaries to Asia Minor. So Mania was Greek. She was from a town named Dardanus, which is just up the road a couple days from Troy, the famous Troy. And her husband happened to be an official of the Persian Empire until he died. So Mania got a retinue together and she went to the capital of, I guess, her husband's boss, you might say, um, a man named Pharnabazas, who was the satrap of Daskilium, the, the fortress that controlled the wider region. Where Dardanus, uh, where Dardanus lay, and she said to Pharnabazus, my husband was loyal to you. He brought in the tribute on time, he came when you called, now that he's dead, why not make me satrap in his place? If I don't do a good job, you can just get rid of me. And so as Xenophon relates, Pharnabazus, the satrap at Deskilium, decided the woman should be satrap. She paid over the tribute no less scrupulously than her husband had done. And she always brought gifts to Pharnabazus when ever she went to meet him, and whenever he visited her territories, her land, he found that her hospitality was much finer and more enjoyable than all of his other subordinates. So she must have received him in proper Persian style, with proper Persian drinking. Uh, this grave stele comes from near the site of Daskalaeum. It shows probably a husband and wife banqueting together, and notice both the man and the woman have their cups in uh, that sophisticated style. So as we come to this, the end of this survey of eating and drinking between Greeks and Persians, um, I think what the unique stories of Xenophon help us realize is one of the ways in which the Persians define their empire. 
we tend to think about empires as having borders or boundary markers, right? The empire begins here, there's a line. But the stories that Xenophon tells us help reveal another way of marking out an empire. When the elites of that empire, whether they're Persians ethnically or whether they're other people such as Mania, who share the same set of elite practices, who drink in a particular manner, uh, when they all agree that that is a way of defining uh, membership in the empire, then you might say that the empire is not marked by lines and, and boundaries, it's, it's marked by drinking. Where there is Persian drinking, there there is the Persian Empire. Uh, so thank you so much for your attention, and thank you for letting us have our, our, our time away from my three lovely children. <laughs>